And we're live <laughs> here with Nick Young. He's going to be talking to us about common errors in CRDs and how to avoid them. Um, Nick, I'm going to give you two extra minutes because we're actually starting two minutes late. Oh, okay. Thank all you. Right. I know. I know. I'm You're very kind. Generosity. Yeah, you are. It's generosity all about generosity. Personified. That's you. Take it away. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Nick Young. Uh, I am talking to you today about why you shouldn't do what Charlie Don't does. Uh, exactly why uh, I'm using that, I will explain in a minute. But yeah, so I want to talk today about uh, avoiding any patterns in CID design. I'm going to try and keep it a little lighter by, uh, by uh, using this uh, guy, Charlie Don't. But before we do that, so who am I and why should I be talking about this? Um, I started using CIDs uh, early in 2017 when they were called third-party resources um, before they got renamed. Um, I spent a long time building out uh, Contour's HTTP proxy resource that replaced the other CRD ingress route, um, and, and I have been involved since in Gateway API since its inception uh, at the start in KubeCon San Diego. So I have been doing CRDs for a long time. I have made many, many, many mistakes, um, some of which uh, are still extant in the Gateway API. Um, uh, so I'm trying to, you know, we, <laughs> I mean, we're human, we make mistakes, um, but uh, what I'm trying to do is to make it so that not as many people have to make the mistakes that I did. So. But why all this business about Charlie Don't? Well, I'm thinking The Simpsons. Uh, so in this episode, uh, Bart, gets a, uh, Bart gets a knife, and he's reading the uh, 10 do's and 500 don'ts of knife safety. And he uh, has a whole section called uh, Don't Do What Donnie Don't Does. And so uh, you know, I really liked the alliteration there. And so I wanted to uh, yeah, present you with the 10 do's and 100 don'ts of CRD design. Ah, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but uh, what I am going to present you with, oh, hang on, it is not updating. Come on, you can do it. There we go. Um, so what I am going to do is walk through some CID design anti-patterns using Charlie Don't. You see how I've uh, chosen the name carefully to have the letter CID in it uh, as our straw man, and I want to give you some tips about how you avoid it. So, so, oh, why is this showing on my screen? There we go. Okay, so this is Charlie Don't. Uh, Charlie works on a custom controller for Kubernetes at BigCo. Uh, he has the worst luck and always manages to choose the absolute worst design option. Uh, so, sucks for Charlie. Uh, but benefit to everyone here because uh, you get to find out from his mistakes. So, let's learn about what Charlie don't. So, Charlie don't doesn't know about the API conventions and API changes docs. These are the most important docs for Kubernetes API design. There are 10 years of API design experience relatively condensed into only about like 10 to 15,000 words for you to read. Um, but you know, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of text, um, but they, it's really, really, really dense, very good information. That is the basis for most of what I'm going to tell you today. right? Like I am standing on the shoulders of giants here. Uh, I have injected my own personal experience where possible. But you know, really, if you are doing CID design, you need to have these two links bookmarked, and you need to be like referring back to them often. I do all the time. So, but, uh, you know, Charlie Don't also doesn't stop to figure out how users are going to use the CID. If you are building a CID for a controller in Kubernetes, this is the number one thing you've got to think about, right? Like, at the end of the day, a CID is about the people who are going to use it. If you are not making your thing such that the people who are going to use it find it easy and want to use it, then your thing will not be used, right? Like, this is, you know, basic humanity. Um, the questions I like to ask myself are, if I was using this, how would I understand if it's working or not? And another one that I like to use, I call it the troubleshooting distance. It's how many kubectl commands would I need to type to understand what's going on, right? Like, and you want, that, you want that number to be one, right? Like that's the ideal number is one. You type one kubectl command and you're like, oh, now I see why this thing that I just did didn't work. The one kubectl command told me exactly what I needed to know. But so thinking about your users. So you want to use spec and status unless you have a very good reason not to. Spec is the intent that, that your user wants, and status is the result that they have got. Um, you don't need to use status when it's used as an input for another thing, like secret and config map, um, or when the intent and the result are stored in separate objects, like a persistent volume claim and persistent volume. Those are perfectly valid patterns, but almost always, uh, if you know why you need those things, then you know why you can ignore what I just said. <laughs> um, 
So, like, yeah, I think it's really important uh, that, that I think that VS Code thing is going to stay there bouncing for the rest of the thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so, uh, lesson for everybody, make sure you close out of everything before you start your presentation. Um, status should also have a con condition standard using the condition type. Now, that you'll see conditions in lots of parts uh, of the API. Um, you know, nodes have conditions, pods have conditions, a bunch of other stuff. They are a list type map, which is a, like it's a list of, of objects, and they are a map by type. Um, okay, look, I, I'm, it's bothering everyone, it's bothering me. <laughs> Go away, thank you. Okay, sorry. Okay, so conditions are a, a list of objects uh, where they are effectively a map by the type field in the object, right? So they have a type reason and a message field. The type is something like, uh, on, on a node object, you have uh, you know, out of memory error. Um, or you know, more, more uh, often, most things have a ready condition that just says everything is okay, situation normal, you have nothing to worry about. If that condition has um, status false, then you know that something has gone wrong and you need to look into exactly what the problem is. Um, so, yeah, you should, when you're making your own CIDs, you should also use this pattern. It's a really easy way. People know to go and look at the conditions. People have started building tooling around parsing conditions, and it's a standard upstream struct that you should use. One thing that is optional that you should also use is the observe generation field. Um, this takes the uh, auto incrementing uh, metadata dot generation field from every Kubernetes object, and the rule is when you set observe generation inside a condition, what that does is say this condition is relevant for generation X of this object. So it's like a staleness check for the, for the status. And so that means that when you look at the status, you can also look at the object, because you have to get the whole object to get the status. You can look at the metadata generation field and the observed generation, and make sure they match. If they don't match, then the controller either is broken or hasn't reconciled that object yet. So it's like a, a, a checksum that lets you know that the status you're, you're looking at is up to date. That's why it's really important that if you're writing a controller, you should use it. Um, yeah, and so because conditions are standard, um, there's tool that you can do, write tooling that will duck type them. Uh, duck typing is when it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck. Um, and so you can take a condition stanza and write tooling that will look for status.conditions and parse any object that has the, the field status.conditions in this thing, and you can write tooling that will print the conditions for you. Um, okay. So, next one. Come on, I need my picture of Charlie. Um, I went to a lot of effort to make Charlie. <coughs> So, um, Charlie, don't makes all fields required. Um, you know, when a field is required, you always have to specify it on input, um, and fields are required by default. Now, if anybody has ever written a Kubernetes YAML, you should understand why having to specify every single field every time would completely suck. You know, like, nobody wants to have to specify the things when every field, when probably you may only, only a couple of those fields will be relevant to what you're actually doing. So, what you should be trying to do is to make f as many fields as possible optional and consider adding a default value. However, the default value thing is a little bit tricky because it also depends on whether or not the zero value for a field is meaningful. So for some things, um, you know, say you wanted to have a, you know, close to near and dear to my heart as a timeout field. Um, if you want to set the a length of timeout time, of a timeout in seconds, sometimes the va a value of zero means don't have a timeout or disable the timeout. Now, for a go struct, if you have an integer field, then a zero is, uh, is the empty value. So if you don't supply the, um, in that case, if you don't supply, if you set the field as optional and you don't set a default, then the, then the default value will be don't have a timeout. Probably you don't want that. So in that case, you should probably look at adding a default. Now, there is an important point about pointers, is that if you have a field be a pointer, that lets you have like three uh, effective things. Not set, set to the zero value, or set to some other value. Uh, and so that can be really relevant for when you're designing a thing. If you want to have a distinction between unset and set to a zero value, then you should use a pointer for that field, for a basic field. Okay, that was a bit, that was a bit in depth, sorry. Um, but now, there's another, there's another great thing about making fields optional, and that is that uh, you, may, you may have noticed that you know, lots of fields, when you do the JSON tags, you can put emit, em, emit empty inside the JSON tags for a field. Um, those, two, those two fields imply each other. 
So if I make a field optional, Kubernetes will automatically make that add emit empty to the JSON tags for that field. And if you put emit empty, then it makes the field, then Kubernetes will make that field optional. Um, technically, optional means you don't need to put this in on input, and emit, em and emit empty means on output, if there's nothing in here, don't output the field. Um, but so, and the idea is here that if you want one, you basically always want the other. Uh, and so that's why Kubernetes will just do that for you. Okay, so let's talk defaulting. You can set defaults for any optional field. You can set defaults for a required field, but they will never do anything because you have to supply a value on input, so there's no point su supplying a default value. Um, when you're using kubebuilder annotations, you just use plus kubebuilder default. Um, I mean, you, setting defaults for uh, scalar values like strings and, uh, and integers is reasonably straightforward. Actually, a lot of the, one of the sort of sort of slightly hidden rules is that you probably should consider not using an integer value unless you really need to, uh, because parsing of integer values can be weird. Um, you're better off using a string that you use that you then parse into an integer later, most of the time. Um, but you can also set defaults for structs, which includes values for fields inside those structs. Um, so in gateway, in gateway API, we actually use these for gateway. You can see this is the default for gateway status for conditions. We add two conditions by default, type accepted and type programmed, um, with a message of waiting for controller. That's because every controller that implements a gateway, gateway API is expected to touch these conditions and update them once the gateway is reconciled. And so once, you, once your controller gateway API implementation has touched the gateway and has reconciled it, you have to update these two things. That's why we populate them always, so that, again, going back to making your users understand how the thing works, if as a user you look at a gateway and it still says waiting for controller, then no controller is reconciling that gateway at the moment and you've probably made a mistake somewhere. And so again, that's, that's where this sort of thing comes back to. As an author, as you can see, it's super verbose, right? It kind of sucks having to specify it like this, but this is, yeah, it's better to be able to specify it, trust me, than not being able to specify it at all. Okay, where are we at? So, <laughs> okay, this is one of my favorite, most esoteric things about defaulting. And we need to talk for a little bit about storage in Kubernetes. So when you create a Kubernetes object, the object at some point is persisted into the storage version inside etcd. Okay, that's like step one. Um, when you do that, any field that is defaulted is not actually saved into, the, into etcd. So if I have uh, you know, a timeout field, to use that example again, and it defaults to 10 seconds, and I, and I don't specify it, in stored in etcd, there will be no timeout field stored. When you read from, when you say, please get me this object, Kubernetes will give you the timeout field set to 10 seconds, but it's not actually stored in etcd until uh, you know, or while you leave it unspecified. However, if you get an object and say, oh, I'm going to get this object and now I'm going to make a change in some other field and then you put the object back, because Kubernetes gives you the defaults, when you put the object back, you have now taken that default and set it as a value. And so now that default has been sort of crystallized into an actual value and Kubernetes has no way of knowing that you actually just wanted the default. So. This is like a real classic gotcha about, gotcha about defaults, is that if you set them, you have to kind of assume that at some point someone's going to poke the, poke the uh, object and that that default is going to get crystallized in there. So as an author, if you update the default, some resources will, may change their default value and some won't because it depends on whether or not they've been accessed and had an apply cycle put to them. So this is just, this is one of those things that I like to tell people and watch them sort of go, oh, what the? Um, but yeah, so defaults are not always default, defaulted, right? Like, so as a CRD author, you need to know that when you set a default, it's kind of like more of a guideline, right? Like that you, you can't guarantee that every value that used to be the default is actually gonna be updated when you update a default. Okay, so that, that the most important thing is, Updating the default changes the value only as long as no one's read it out and put it back in. Okay, so Charlie Don't also doesn't structure his data enough. So this, is, this goes back to, if you actually look at the API conventions, there's a, there's a section called, uh, what is it? 
Um, I can't remember the exact date, the exact name, but it, if you go back, it goes back to like an issue in Kubernetes, Kubernetes that's like number sub 1000, right? Like so sub 1000 in KK is very old. Uh, and this is a discussion by a bunch of people who were making Kubernetes in the early days being like, okay, so we need to be able to have arbitrary fields and we're gonna, what sort of fields are good and what sort of fields aren't. And I think it was Joe Beto who said, we wanna preserve the invariant that every value on the left of a colon is a field name, not a value. And so what that means is, what it comes down to is, don't use map string anything, right? Like generally, um, you shouldn't use a map string, a, a map of mapping string values to something else, except for annotations and labels. That's the only time when you can use a map string in any Kubernetes object. Otherwise, it's very hard to tell as a user, you know, is this a map or is this like an object that, that's a struct that now has string values on the other side. There's no way as a user for you to look at the YAML and tell. Using this convention means that, that you, know, you never need to ask that question. The way that you need to map is you use list type equals map and list map key equals field. And looking at this slide, I really probably should have given you an example of what one of these looks like. But, but what, what, I, what, what this does is you have a list of objects uh, and each object has a set of fields and you say, okay, this list is actually a map, and the map key is one of the fields. So conditions are, conditions are a great example, but what the most important thing here is that when you, if you push a new object, a new uh, element onto that list, and it has a sa the same key as an existing, as an existing entry, that, that, the new one that you just pushed will actually overwrite the old one, because it's a map. Right? It, the API server treats it as a map that just happens to be stored as a list. And so these are, I mean, it's really useful to be able to do maps, but it also means that when you like deserialize the map, you actually get a list. So you need to look for fields that look like this uh, it, when you're using them, but when you're writing them, it's really handy because it means you can actually make a map without actually having to violate that invariant. Okay. So have I lost anybody yet? Are we good? No, we're good? Okay, okay. Thanks, thanks for the vote of confidence as always, Stephen. <clears throat> um, okay, so Charlie Don't uses bool types and bounded enums. Both, with the reason being, both of these types are super hard to extend. Poor guy, just have, it makes all the wrong decisions. Um, so, bool fields. Every time you think you want a bool, you don't. <laughs> right, like, you don't actually want a bool, what you actually want is a choice between two options, right? Like, you know, Almost every time you want to put a bool inside a, a CID, you're saying, oh, you know, hey, uh, you know, do behavior A true or do behavior A false. But when you're not doing behavior A, that means you do want behavior B. So the much better thing to do is to have a string field and just explicitly say behavior A or behavior B, right? Like, or setting B, setting A, like, the, the you know, may, you can make this as just a string field I say use an enum with subject to the caveats I'm about to say about enums, but like, which is really what you want is a string is a, is a string field with a set of constants for the different values that you could possibly choose because then you get add more values. So, about that, let's talk enums. So, if you supply an enum um, with a set of fixed values, technically adding a new value to that, uh, to that enum is an API breaking change and guess what, you now need a new API version. That is a very big deal. If you want, if you, adding, an, adding a value to an enum means you need to go from v1 alpha 1 to v1 alpha 2, now you have two lots of uh, resources, two types of resources you need to watch, you have a storage migration to do, you have uh, you know, a bunch of different Go structs you've got to do, it's a very big deal. You don't want to do it, right? So you want to keep your changes backwards compatible. Now, so the way around this is when you make an enum, instead of actually making an enum using a QBuilder directive or an AP open API thing, you just make a string field and you say the only value values for this are the following values, and then you supply constants for all of those things in your Go types. When you do that, and as long as you say, hey, this thing, this enum is not bounded, you know, I'm going, we may add new values later, you need to handle unknown values here. If you do those two things, then an adding a new value to that enum is no longer a breaking change because it's not actually an enum, it's like a pseudo enum. So um, this one burned us pretty early on Gateway API. We had, uh, I, think, 
think it was the protocol field that we had to sort of walk back when we moved from uh, V1 Alpha 1 to V1 Alpha 2. That was one of the changes we had to make. We had to like change change this the the protocol field in the gateway API listener from being an actual enum to doing this you know uh, type string with uh, with constant supplied value, um, and it sucked. I really don't want anyone else to have to do that. So please, please remember, use a string alias as the type. So you know, type some setting string is your, is your type definition, and then provide constants with all the correct values as part of your definitions. That is the way to do this safely so that you can add more constants later. OK. Now, this one is a favorite of mine. Charlie don't allows arbitrary cross namespace references. This is terrifying, right? Like this is like one of the worst things you can do uh, uh, for a CID in terms of security, um, because a namespace is the most important security boundary in Kubernetes, right? Like there are other security boundaries. You don't have to grant access to a whole namespace. You can do a bunch of cool stuff with RBAC, but practically, when most people think about Kubernetes security, the fundamental unit is, is namespaces most of the time. So. And so you can cross namespace boundaries with references if you do the right thing. What's the right thing? Well, coincidentally, uh, on, in Gateway API, we had to learn how to do this because we needed to be able to do it for a bunch of things. So the only way to make cross namespace references safely is for both sides to agree that it's OK. So the person who is making the reference, the referrer, needs to make the reference, and that's the thing that starts off the process. But the person who is receiving the reference, the referent, needs to do something to allow the reference, right? Like, so it needs to be a handshake. Both, side, both parties need to agree. It's effectively a contract, right? Cross namespace and references must not be allowed by default, because otherwise, uh, I, as the uh, CID user, could accidentally refer to something that I'm not allowed, that the person who owns it doesn't want me to, right? Like there's no, you need the person who owns the thing that you're referring to to say it's OK that in, for incoming references to do this. You know, and then the owner of the referent have, must have to take direct action to do this as well. You can't default to accept all namespaces. You know, you've got to default to don't, you know, only take stuff within my local namespace, don't accept any cross namespaces. If the owner then chooses to say, hey, no, no, I want to allow all namespaces, like, that's on them. You've made it hard, you've had to jump through some hoops, but you know, it, it is a valid choice for them to make, but they need to take direct action in order to do that. Okay, so. Here's some examples. Uh, gateway, gateway API route to listener binding. So Gateway API has, for those of you who don't know Gateway API, Gateway API has gateways. Gateways have listeners and addresses. Listeners have ports and protocols, and, and a gateway binds an address or multiple addresses to all the listeners. Right? So a listener is like a listening port plus the protocols that are on it, and a, listen, and a listener is a bucket for routes to attach into to then take that, take that port and funnel traffic off to somewhere else. So routes um, have a specified parent ref, and they say, I want to attach to a gateway. And then the gateway has a thing on it that says, I will allow routes that look like this. And so there are two so keys, uh, a kind, which means that a listener can say, I only will allow HTTP routes, not TCP routes or something like that, and there is a, uh, a namespace selector that lets you do stuff like you know, any namespace in this list, any namespace that matches this label, and a few other things like that. But the idea here is that you know, the owner of the gateway has to make the namespace, has to make, uh, take a, uh, a certain, a definite action to allow this thing. By default, uh, gateways will only accept atta routes attached from routes inside the same namespace. Okay, the other one is reference grant for secrets. This one is, is even more easy to understand. So this, this use case is, I have a TLS listener, I need a key pair. I need a certificate and a key, right, to terminate TLS. For this to happen, you know, the TLS key pair needs to live somewhere. Maybe as a platform team, I don't want everybody who has access to the gateways namespace to be able to read my www.company.com key pair, because like, I've paid, you know, before Let's Encrypt, I would have paid thousands of dollars for that. Um, but even so, I don't want people to be able to impersonate my web server. So I want to keep that in some super secure namespace, but I want gateways to be able to use that key pair without people knowing the value of the key pair. 
And so what we, can do, what we do is the gateway listener can point to a TLS secret in another namespace. There's a namespace field there. Um, and, but the, in the secret namespace, there is this extra object called a reference grant, which the owner of the secret creates that says that the, uh, the access, uh, you are allowed to use this secret from namespaces that are called this. So a gateway that is in namespace foo is allowed in a reference grant, and then a gateway that is in namespace foo, when you try and make that reference, the gateway, the gateway API controllers have to say, okay, yes, that reference is allowed, you're good. A gateway in namespace bar that tries to reference the, uh, the secret in namespace, the secret that allows it from namespace foo, it says, sorry, you can't do that, you can't use that. So reference grant is a really important tool that gives you the means to be able to do um, the two-way handshake even in the absence of having the, uh, you know, of having secrets be able to support that thing natively. Now, there is an important reference uh, going on. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, reference grant is actually used in SIG storage. Um, the SIG storage folks wanted to do that for a certain type of snapshot config. Um, but uh, KEP3766 um, is adding a new concept of referential authorization to CoreCube. Now, what this is doing is it's going to be arbitrary reference grant for any Kubernetes object in core Kubernetes, right? So what it will be is that when, you're, um, when, you, when this is complete, you won't need reference grant anymore because core Kubernetes will be able to, you'll be able to create an object next to a secret that says, allow access to this secret from namespaces that look like this to users that look like this. So you'll be able to say, only allow access to this secret from gateway implementations and, and some other cool stuff like that. So it's a really cool cap. Um, that, you know, I, my name is actually on, but I haven't done any work on it for like eight months, um, you know, b because, you know, bandwidth. But uh, Rob Scott and some others are doing some really interesting, cool work there. Uh, and hang on, there we go. There is the uh, QR code for that, uh, for the PR that is currently working on uh, updating that cap. Uh, okay, so we are down to near the end here. Charlie don't makes breaking API changes without incrementing the API version. Man, this is like one of the worst things you can do, right? Like, so please don't do this. Um, but you, the, uh, the API version is you know, usually something like v1, v1 alpha 2. Now, I tried to write this down in as short a way as I could. A change is not breaking if a valid object after the change was also valid before the change, assuming you discard unknown fields, right? Like, basically, if you add a new field that defaults to doing nothing, um, then that's a not a breaking change. If you add a value to a field that, if you don't know about it, doesn't do anything, that's not a breaking change. But the exact list of all of those things is really complicated. That API changes doc is a few, like many thousand words, all about exactly what constitutes non-breaking API changes and how you should do them. Um, but yeah, here's some examples of breaking changes. Adding a new required field. I mean, seems pretty obvious that that would be a breaking change. Adding a new field that changes the meaning of an existing field. This one is a bit subtle. So if you add another field that says, oh, yeah, that other field that you, that timeout field that you added, it now means client timeout, not backend timeout, right? Like, that is a breaking change because you've changed how the API works. But one that, one that has caught us a couple of times is that tightening field validation is a breaking change, but loosening it is okay. Because if you tighten the field validation, then values that used to be valid are no longer valid. If you loosen the field validation, then values that used to be valid are still valid. Right? So the lesson is, when you are doing field validation, make it as tight and as, and as uh, small scope as possible, so that then, uh, if you need to loosen it later, you can. OK, uh, and that's the IPA ch API changes doc. Okay, why is that? Okay, let's recap. Okay, things are working. So, read the API Bibles. Again, I've hopped on this, but it's, it's for a good reason. Think about how your users will use the CID, use status and status conditions. Make as many fields as possible optional with defaults if you can. Avoid maps except for labels and annotations, use list type mapping instead. Avoid bool types and boundary nums. Avoid cross namespace references, make them a handshake if you do use them. Hopefully, soon, CAP3766 will be in and you'll be able to just use that. Um, 
don't make breaking API changes without an API version bump. Because an API version bump is such a big deal, basically that translates to don't make breaking API changes. <coughs> you can, you just gotta be careful. So, questions? And thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, as someone who wants to get started with authoring CRDs now, I go home, I have this talk in mind, and I'm sure I will make half of those mistakes mm -hmm. anyways. So um, especially regarding breaking API changes, is there some tooling which uh, statically checks whether I, common mistakes have been made or anything? I would love for there to be. Um, okay. it, is, it is a wish list of mine to build something like that, but it requires uh, an amount of bandwidth and time that I have not had. Um, but yeah, there should be, I agree. It would okay. be really nice. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? No? no? Okay, great. Thanks so much. Thanks Nick. very much, everybody. <laughs> All right. Up next, we've got Victor Farsik. <laughs>